This talk is on benign bone tumors. So benign bone tumors can be classified in multiple different ways based on uh, histology, based on morphology. Um, the Anakin classification of benign bone tumors uh, is uh, divided into three different types. There's latent, active, and aggressive. And I think that uh, uh, trying to understand benign bone tumors in uh, this manner uh, is most helpful in achieving the most appropriate diagnosis and uh, progressing with uh, the most appropriate treatment. Um, I'll also be discussing some hereditary uh, benign bone tumors. So to start with uh, benign uh, latent uh, tumors, these are uh, uh, typically asymptomatic. Uh, they have a narrow zone of transition, so they're very geographic. Uh, there's no soft tissue mass. There's no soft, there's no periosteal reaction. And typically these do not uh, require any treatment, including a biopsy, as they are uh, diagnosed uh, by imaging alone, typically. Uh, one example uh, of uh, a benign latent tumor that's very common, uh, particularly in the pediatric population, but also seen in young adults, is a non-ossifying fibroma. Typically these are metaphyseal and eccentric, as you can see from the images shown. It has a soap bubble appearance, and this is typically uh, seen in fibrous tumors, the soap bubble appearance. Um, and they're frequently also incidentally found for other uh, injuries, for example, an ankle sprain or a knee sprain uh, that may prompt uh, imaging. Surgery is only performed for pathologic fractures or chronic pain, and when the uh, non-ossifying fibroma uh, expands to more than 50% of the width of bone. And uh, that's uh, thought to increase the risk of pathologic fracture. And so uh, surgery is performed. And typically surgery is intralesional curtage with uh, bone grafting uh, when needed. Otherwise, uh, patients who have uh, these lesions can just be observed uh, and the parents reassured. And chondroma is another uh, common uh, bone uh, lesion. Uh, which is benign and typically latent. Um, the, uh, it does have a very different appearance in long bones as opposed to the hand. Um, this is typically a metaphyseal lesion, can extend sometimes to the diaphys diaphysis. It uh, has in long bones a popcorn-like appearance, whereas it's uh, lytic in the hand, uh, as seen with the x-ray of the uh, lesion in the distal phalanx. It's frequently incidentally found uh, as well for other uh, for x-rays for other reasons um, and uh, it's important to understand that the uh, enchondroma is the most common bone tumor of the hand. Um, one of the problems in the long bones is that it's very difficult to differentiate from a, a low-grade chondrosarcoma. Even biopsying uh, chondroid lesions uh, can be uh, tricky because certain areas may be lower grade uh, or appear benign, whereas other grade other areas may be higher grade. Um, so we uh, focus mainly mainly on uh, symptoms and whether there's uh, uh, industrial scalping uh, to suggest whether or not uh, this uh, lesion needs to be evaluated further uh, for the possibility of a chondrosarcoma. In the phalanges, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, presence of these lithic bone lesions could uh, uh, result in a pathologic fracture with uh, a very uh, um, benign uh, sort of types of injuries uh, that you wouldn't expect to develop fractures. Osteochondroma uh, in adults, uh, I've divided into adults and uh, children. Uh, in adults, an osteochondroma is a benign latent uh, lesion, whereas it uh, tends to be active in, in children. Uh, these are metaphyseal. Uh, the, uh, the hallmark of the, these uh, tumors is that they are, have continuity uh, with uh, the uh, medullary canal. Um, depending on their location, they may com compress nearby structures or uh, irritate certain bursa. They definitely do perform uh, do form bursae at some at some times, and uh, there are some reports where uh, pseudoaneurysms could develop in, in nearby vessels. Um, very rarely, these can uh, malignant, uh, transform into malignancy, and typically when they do transform, these are low-grade chondrosarcomas, uh, typically, never, uh, typically not high-grade. Um, a clue to uh, know whether or not uh, these have transformed in an adult uh, patient uh, would be uh, growth uh, after skeletal maturity. 
and a development of a cartilage cap that's more than two centimeters thick. The next group are the benign active. And the benign active are typically symptomatic. They're also geographic. Uh, they uh, can form periosteal reaction that's well ordered. They typically do not have a soft tissue mass. Uh, and they may or may not have matrix depending on uh, uh, which, what's their diagnosis. Examples of these uh, are uh, osteoid osteoma and uh, uh, unicameral bone cyst. Um, the treatment is based on symptoms. So uh, let's go into a few of these uh, diagnoses. So unicameral bone cyst, uh, this tends to be central. It tends to uh, occupy the entire width of the bone. Obviously, this uh, depends on when it's diagnosed. Uh, but typically, it does not uh, develop any uh, more widening than the actual width of the physis. And that's a very important differentiation between, for example, a unicameral bone cyst and a aneurysmal bone cyst. Fractures could develop, and it's important to understand that in fractures in the proximal humerus, those can be left alone. Uh, obviously, the treatment, if they're symptom symptomatic or they develop recurrent fractures, or there's uh, not much healing after the initial fracture and there's still an impending fracture uh, there. Obviously, in the lower extremity, such as in the proximal femur, um, uh, impending fractures or uh, pathologic fractures need to be treated surgically in order to allow for uh, weight bearing. Obviously, there's a higher rate of recurrence in some of these patients, and those are the ones who are under the age of 10 years old, and uh, those uh, with uh, lesions adjacent to the physis, and uh, those are called the active unicameral bone cysts. So again, patients who are under 10 years old and with lesions that are just adjacent to the physis have a higher risk of a local recurrence. Osteodiastoma uh, is another common uh, lesion that we find. It's a, uh, essentially there are no abnormal cells, but it is a neoplasm, uh, develops uh, night pain, and uh, particularly resolves with NSAIDs. 15% um, of these uh, lesions may develop in the spine, and they develop an atypical scoliosis. Um, in the concave side, and you typically lesions on the concave side of the uh, uh, of the spine of the curve. Um, it's very common in the lower extremity, particularly in the proximal aspect, so in the proximal femur. And uh, the treatment is uh, generally uh, percutaneous ablation by radiofrequency. And uh, the surgery can be performed for areas that are difficult to reach with a uh, percutaneous probe. Um, or that are unsafe uh, when heating with a probe. Um, the hallmark of these uh, lesions are, is the nidus seen on a uh, CT scan. Obviously, there, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, bone uh, sclerosis uh, that forms around them, and uh, that can be seen on an X-ray as well. Here's an example of a patient uh, who's 15 years old and presenting with hip pain. Uh, it was uh, thought that this patient... Uh, had uh, FAI and she underwent arthroscopy. Uh, she did have continued pain. As you can see here on the MRI, there is edema in the middle image. CT scan was performed and uh, you can see the uh, nidus uh, of the osteoid osteoma uh, in, that, uh, in this patient. So diagnosis is osteoid osteoma. The treatment is uh, RFA. And so this, is, this patient underwent radiofrequency ablation with the resolution of her symptoms. So this is a paper that came out uh, last year uh, where they reviewed patients who uh, uh, had uh, osteodosteum about the hip. Um, a significant percentage of them uh, had an alternative diagnosis, so that's 46%, and the most common alternative diagnosis was femoral tabular impingement um, with non-specific MRI findings. So it's important to understand uh, you know, the uh, history of a, and take a good history of a patient uh, with hip pain and uh, in order to carefully rule out uh, osteoid osteoma. Fibrous dysplasia is another uh, common lesion found in the uh, proximal uh, aspect of the humerus and the, the femur. Uh, this are, these are metadiaphyseal lesions that have a, a lytic ground glass appearance uh, on pathology it's known to have the alphabet soup appearance. Um, this can be associated with uh, other syndromes such as McHugh and Albright, um, where, uh, and also uh, Mazabrod syndrome, for example. 
so with McCune Albright, uh, there may be cafe au lait spots and endocrinopathies. With Mazabrod syndrome, there is associated uh, soft tissue uh, or intramuscular myxomas. It's important to understand that when you do operate on these patients for fracture or deformity, that uh, cancellous bone graft is not used as this gets resorbed. Uh, there's thought that uh, uh, using cortical strut grafts are uh, more uh, effective uh, in uh, maintaining uh, the structural support uh, when fixing these, uh, these lesions. Eosinophilic granuloma, these are typically uh, diaphyseal and uh, uh, they are known as the great mimicker, so it's difficult sometimes to uh, uh, come to the diagnosis. Um, it is just associated with many syndromes that uh, are, uh, have a high mortality at a young age. Uh, however, when they appear uh, isolated, uh, such as these lesions, this lesion in the uh, femoral shaft, um, they typically resolve on their own, typically after a biopsy or curtage. Uh, they could develop a vertebra plana in the spine. And uh, under electron microscopy, the Burbeck granule is uh, diagnostic. This is a patient who's 12 years old, a kickboxer who had some right knee pain. Um, there was a normal examination of the uh, knee at the time. Uh, any patient with knee pain should be evaluated as well for, for the hip. Uh, X-rays were done, uh, which showed this lesion in the uh, femoral shaft and MRI was also performed uh, and uh, this was diagnostic uh, by uh, imaging alone as eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, actually this patient, uh, their parents uh, did in insist on getting a biopsy uh, as the uh, uh, diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma was also raised with them. And, uh, the biopsy did confirm uh, eosinophilic granuloma and uh, the patient uh, did have resolution of this uh, lesion. As you can see uh, on the x-ray on the left, the bone did have significant time to uh, remodel and thicken in that area uh, in order to re respond uh, to the tumor, which is uh, very typical for benign lesions rather than uh, malignant lesions. Osteochondroma in children uh, tends to be an active uh, lesion. Um, these are metaphyseal, uh, they're right just adjacent to the physis and they grow away from the physis. Uh, we tend to avoid, uh, try to avoid surgery until skeletal maturity due to the uh, increased uh, risk of recurrence and uh, risk of uh, damage to uh, the perichondrial ring. So the third uh, group is the uh, benign aggressive tumor. Uh, these tend to be symptomatic. Uh, they're geographic or permutative, but the hallmark of these uh, lesions is that they do develop a neocortex. Um, they sometimes have cortical erosion, uh, occasional soft tissue mass, and the five benign aggressive uh, bone tumors uh, are giant cell tumor, ABC, osteoblastoma, chondroblastoma, and chondromyxoid fibroma. These are the five benign aggressive bone tumors. And so when you see a, a, an aggressive lesion that's symptomatic uh, on imaging, uh, those are the five that should come to mind, and uh, location and appearance uh, will help you narrow it down. Start with aneurysmal bone cysts. Um, these are metaphyseal, uh, adjacent uh, to uh, the physis in uh, patients who are uh, not skeletally mature. Um, these are blood-filled uh, uh, spaces, so MRIs show the fluid fluid levels. 30% arise from other tumors. The tumor to uh, uh, keep in mind that it may be associated with is a telangiectatic osteosarcoma, and you don't want to miss that diagnosis. Uh, when in doubt, a uh, frozen section intraoperatively uh, would be very helpful. And as with all benign aggressive tumors, an extended interlesional curtage with bone grafting or cement is the treatment of choice. Here's an example of a proximal femur aneurysmal bone cyst. Uh, this was uh, curated and bone grafted, with cancellous bone graft, and uh, 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 prophylactically uh, fixed with uh, flexible nails. Uh, this is the lesion uh, several years later uh, showing healing. Osteoblastoma, it's the uh, cousin of osteoblastoma. They look exactly the same under the microscope, except uh, osteoblastoma uh, tends to be larger. Uh, it, uh, anything that's more than two centimeters is the uh, diagnosis of osteoblastoma. It's more con common in the appendicular skeleton, but frequently cited to be uh, in the uh, 
posterior elements of the spine. Most are not very aggressive, although it is considered a benign aggressive tumor, uh, most aren't actually extremely aggressive. Um, they uh, can have secondary ABCs uh, form. Chondroblastoma, uh, another uh, benign aggressive uh, lesion that's uh, formed in the epiphysis. Uh, it's uh, mostly in skeletally immature patients, tends not to cross the physis. Uh, there's uh, plenty of edema and uh, uh, joint effusion as seen uh, on the MRI. Um, it has a cobblestone uh, chicken wire appearance, uh, as you can see on the uh, top right hand corner. The treatment is curtage and bone graft in symptomatic patients. Patients do tend to be symptomatic. They present with pain. Um, common locations are the proximal tibia, proximal humerus, or proximal femur. In the tibia, a trans approach uh, uh, can be uh, one of the best ways to get to the tumor, uh, whereas uh, this is, is not always possible with uh, lesions in the proximal femur or uh, uh, the proximal humerus. So a lateral approach with a cortical window uh, and a, uh, a trans uh, 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 physial approach rather than trans epiphyseal approach is needed. Uh, and uh, this can be potentially problematic in much younger patients, um, though uh, chondroblastoma tends not to occur in patients under 80 uh, years of age. Um, if there is a, a concern uh, for the physis, a uh, uh, dislocation of the joint and a uh, uh, trapdoor uh, type of surgery where the uh, articular cartilage is opened up and the tumor is curated and bone grafted and then closed and the hip reduced uh, could be performed and that will avoid uh, the physis. However, uh, damage to the uh, 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 articular surface needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, this patient uh, underwent a uh, 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 transphyseal uh, curtage and grafting with uh, bone substitute. There's uh, another case uh, that was done recently, uh, a similar technique through a uh, lateral cortical window, uh, curtage and grafting with a bone substitute. It's important to understand uh, you know, uh, symptoms and age, uh, how they uh, come together. There's a patient with uh, limping and a three-year-old uh, female with this lesion seen on uh, x-ray. Uh, MRI is important to uh, uh, differentiate uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, lesions. As you can see here, uh, there's a rim enhancing on post gadolinium T1 uh, and not very much joint effusion, just, uh, just edema. And so uh, the diagnosis here is actually osteomyelitis uh, rather than chondroblastoma. Uh, the rim enhancing lesion, in addition to the age of the patient, uh, is, is more suggestive of uh, osteomyelitis than chondroblastoma. Chondromyxoid fibroma, uh, the uh, uh, lesion is typically in the proximal tibia. It's eccentric and metaphyseal. Um, it's uh, lytic, it could have a soap bubble appearance as well because it's also fibrous. Um, in symptomatic patients, you perform a curtage and bone grafting. Um, you could uh, uh, suggest that, yes, it is eccentric and metaphyseal, so it's similar to NOF. Uh, the main difference is that uh, this is seen in adolescents and young adults and tends to be symptomatic uh, and tends to also be in the proximal tibia, whereas uh, we tend to see an on, uh, ossifying fibroma uh, in the distal tibia or distal femur. Uh, but, of course, that's not, uh, not an absolute rule. Giant cell tumor, uh, these are epiphyseal, metaphyseal in location. They tend to be more aggressive. Um, there's cortical destruction uh, uh, and neocortex formation. Sometimes the neocortex could be so thin that it's only apparent on a CT scan rather than on X-ray, and it may have a soft tissue mass. Um, giant cell tumor is managed with extended into lesional curtage, cement uh, or uh, bone graft or bone substitute. Um, when you put in uh, cement, it's easier to uh, assess for any local occurrence, recurrences. Um, new adjuvants, actually, uh, sorry, adjuvants had, have uh, no added value. There's some benefit with liquid nitrogen. However, it's technically difficult and potential for increased complications. Uh, recent data on uh, the use of denosumab has been reported in giant cell tumors. Uh, the problem with denosumab is that uh, if a, a recurrence does, a, does happen, then that's 
is frequent when denosumab is discontinued, and intralesional curtage becomes very difficult and impractical due to the uh, septated bone formation uh, and the difficulty in uh, uh, curating out all of the uh, tumor cells, and, and therefore uh, wide excision uh, would be uh, the treatment of choice in patients who've previously been treated with denosumab uh, uh, rather than intralesional uh, curtage. Also, uh, wide excision could be an option as a one-and-done uh, surgery, particularly in patients who uh, have uh, extension uh, into the articular surface and significant bone destruction uh, such that uh, intralesional cortege is uh, impractical or impossible. This is uh, frequently performed, uh, particularly with aggressive recurrences around the distal radius where, uh, whereby uh, the tumor is... Uh, uh, resected through wide resection and reconstruction could be performed by different means, including uh, using a vascularized uh, proximal fibula. So the main take-home points here, uh, benign latent lesions are uh, typically asymptomatic and don't require much treatment, uh, even a biopsy. Benign active tend to be symptomatic, geographic, no soft tissue mass, uh, and treatment depends on symptoms. Benign aggressive lesions, on the other hand, uh, they tend to be epiphyseal or metaphyseal, they're lytic, there's cortical erosion, there's a neocortex, and frequently these are symptomatic and tend to uh, need uh, treatment with extensive intralesional curtage. Uh, this means not just using a curette, but a high-speed burr uh, and uh, bone grafting. So we'll quickly go over some hereditary uh, benign bone tumors. MHE is uh, one of the most commonly tested ones, and uh, the EXT1, EXT2 uh, gene uh, is the uh, uh, frequently uh, asked question. It is an autosomal dominant uh, uh, hereditary tumor. Um, these grow away from the physis, as you know, with uh, uh, osteochondromas, and uh, they have a uh, here, I've reported a 5 to 10% rate of malignant transformation. It's thought to be a little bit lower than that, probably around 2% to 3%. Uh, and again, when they do transform, they transform into a low-grade chondrosarcoma. In young patients who have MHE, uh, you know, there, there are many deformities that could happen, and the forearm deformities have been well described. Uh, the this is the Masada classification, and essentially it's divided into uh, uh, three uh, groups. Uh, where, where the first group, uh, type 1, uh, it's, it's uh, with a uh, uh, distal uh, ulna uh, osteochondroma, which with relative shortening, uh, and uh, no, and the uh, radiocapitellar joint is reduced. Type 2, A and B, the radiocapitellar joint is dislocated. Uh, in A, there is also a uh, proximal uh, radius osteochondroma. In B, there is none. And in type 3, uh, the osteochondroma is in the distal radius with relative shortening of the distal radius, and that's the one represented in the X-ray uh, to the left. Olie and Mafucci uh, are uh, 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 syndromes with uh, multiple enchondromatoses and skeletal dysplasia. Uh, Mafucci syndrome has the... Uh, uh, addition of uh, hand and foot soft tissue hemangiomas as seen in the uh, clinical image below. Uh, they have a, a higher rate of malignant transformation. Um, Mifuchis can develop some visceral malignancies. Um, in large and symptomatic lesions or in pathologic fractures, curettage and bone grafting uh, with fixation uh, is sufficient. Um, typically, uh, when fractures do occur, uh, the thought was initially to wait until the fracture heals, but now more frequently than not, it's advocated to perform early uh, curettage and uh, fixation. Thank you.